1917, at the height of the First World War, indeed during the Battle of Passchendaele, a collection of essays, this book was produced by Anglican padres who were serving or who had served on the Western Front. The book was edited by Frederick McNutt and he gave it the title The Church in the Furnace. It's a fascinating collection, not just because what it tells us was of concern to those chaplains in 1917, but because of its impact later on the church in England. Stuart, tell us a little bit about the origins of this collection, The Church in the Furnace. The context, of course, is huge numbers of Anglican uh, clergymen um, wishing to become army chaplains, volunteering, becoming temporary chaplains, going out to France uh, and Belgium, uh, and encountering a group of men whom the church had not encountered really since the Industrial Revolution, ordinary working class men, um, relatively few of whom went to church, um, theologically illiterate, would certainly say they were Christian, um, because that was the, almost the default and would have been hugely insulted if you said they weren't, um, but very rarely went to church. And this was a huge culture shock uh, for these Anglican clergymen, the majority of whom, for example, had, had been to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, it was oil and water not mixing at all, really. And, of course, the, one of the things they suddenly discover is that many of the things they had taken for granted just didn't apply. So, for instance, there's, a, there's, a, there's an essay on how relevant is the prayer book. And the conclusion was it was unusable. Um, in today's fairly laissez-faire Church of England, um, people sit fairly lightly on the requirements to use approved liturgies. A hundred years ago, you used the prayer book, you didn't go off piste, as it were, and it was found to be quite unusable. unusable. The language, uh, the length of some of the services, and in fact, some of the chaplains did misbehave, as it were, and, and chopped ch stuff out. And in fact, in many of the essays, they, they emphasise this and they tell you of little tricks they're using. And they say, you should be using these at home because you'll actually be, you'll, you, you'll be, you'll be more effective. It's interesting, when the Expository Times reviewed that book, what did they focus on? They didn't focus on theology, they didn't focus on the big questions, they focused on the issue of prayer book reform which of course would then um, not quite dominate, but be very high profile in the Church of England um, during the 1920s as they try to grapple with its impracticality for the 20th, 20th century. And indeed, it, that they wouldn't grapple with that effectively until the 1960s. Absolutely. But let's leave that aside because there's, there's, there is one element of liturgy that is mentioned in this book that has been enormously successful, and that's the essay by Eric Milner White. And Eric Milner White is, of course, known for something else. Known, of course, for the lesson, uh, the service of lessons and carols that we is inextricably associated with uh, Christmas these days, broadcast on television and radio. Eric Milner White was the originator of that service. And I'm one of those people who, at three o'clock, decide Christmas has begun when I hear, when I tune into Radio 4, and I, I listen to carols from Kings. The curious thing about Milner White is that in this book, he actually gives a very interesting theology of the incarnation. And he says, God has entered into the closeness of, of the world. It's a, it's, you, you, you feel Milner White has been taken out of his Cambridge setting and in, the, and in the, the furnace of the Western Front, he's been given a new insight into the centrality of the Incarnation. And indeed, in that famous opening prayer, he focuses on the Incarnation rather than on the crucifix or the cross, whose hope was in the Word made flesh, and not a hope in salvation or a hope in the cross, but whose hope was in the Word made flesh. And it's interesting, in this essay, 
he's you can see you can all, you can see him reconstructing his theology and if you look at the structure of nine lessons and carols it's actually it's 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 not actually a a soppy christmas story it's the vast plan of god that comes to realization in in what he what he focuses on is in reading the first chapter of john's gospel precisely it's that kind of cosmological context and scale which challenges all our nativity plays and so on I mean, it's worth adding of course that I mean, many of the leading anglican priests of the post-war period um, f are featured there um fr barry uh, became bishop of Southall. um Southern Kennedy, um, of whom we've been doing a lot of work, uh, writes about the difficulties, the religious difficulties of a private soldier. They're all trying to come to terms with the questions, you know, where is God, the problem of evil, um, that were heightened um, under the guns of the Western Front. And it's interesting, they're, they, they, they're, they're a group of chaplains who are talking to one another, they're sharing ideas, and they're forging in that furnace a com a, the beginnings of a completely new and original theology. Linda Parker has done a huge amount of work on what happened to them. She calls them the shell-shocked prophets. And she's done a huge amount of work over the way in which they tried to mould the Church of England. In some ways, not always successfully, because those who had not shared the experience couldn't see the urgency of their demands for church reform. One thing that did come out of it, of course, was um, huge numbers of um, soldiers wanted to become um, clergy, wanted to be ordained, hadn't had the previous ordination, um, educational qualifications. Uh, and so emerging from that was a whole um, kind of pre-ordination college that was at Knutsford in, in Cheshire, which emerged from the work of those uh, chaplains to allow ordinary men uh, to serve as, as clergy in the Church of England. There's been no end of programmes, events, and references to the centenary of the First World War. Many of the essays in The Church in the Furnace haven't stood the test of time. They're works of the day. But some of the essays are true gems of people doing theology right out on the edge and we shouldn't recall those terrible four years without realizing that it had an impact on every aspect of society and it also had a major impact on the development of 20th century theology thanks for coming in Stuart. <laughs>